joined today by John Cockcroft, Chief Executive of Bowls England. Um, John, uh, thank you for doing this. Um, how would you sum up your first year in charge? It's been really fantastic, Rob. It's been a, a strange old year uh, coming into the role in the midst of, of the COVID pandemic, and I'm sure it's felt strange for everyone up and down the country. Uh, but I joined the sport because I felt it had just an enormous potential for growth, and I absolutely 12 months later feel feel exactly the same really proud of the work that the team have done to navigate through what has been fairly unprecedented times and get people back on the greens and enjoying their their bowls we've done some really fantastic work particularly on uh, our first ever marketing campaign let's roll and hugely excited about bowls big weekend um coming up uh, and just generally i feel like we're hopefully evolving the culture of the sport to be a little bit more collaborative, positive uh, and adaptable for change. And I think one of the things that I'll reflect on uh, most warmly is that whilst COVID has been challenging, it's been quite cathartic in the sense it's given us the opportunity as a governing body to take a little step back. We've done an enormous amount of consultation and we've developed a really, really exciting strategy which we feel we can align the whole sport behind. So. It's been a great 12 months. I've got a bit of Zoom fatigue and looking forward to getting back into the office, but uh, I've enjoyed it very much. Oh, that's great to hear. And I think um, you're, you're absolutely right on a number of fronts there. In terms of looking forward to this season, how, how great is it just to be back on the green and see bowlers back on the green? How, how does that make you feel, you know, in terms of, is that, that feels like a success, right? But get people, we've just been able to get people back out there this summer. Absolutely. And that's, it's, what, it's what the sport's all about, isn't it? Um, it's been strange because... In November last year, it felt like the season would happen. In December, with the lockdown, we were sort of uncertain. And it was really helpful when the government developed their roadmap um, in, in February, March time for us to have a structure by which we could get the sport back up and running. Uh, the competition programme, for example, was uh, redeveloped to um, manage that, that roadmap and make sure that we could get all the qualification games in and the national finals in time and it's just been fantastic that the roadmap has happened on on time uh, so that things are going according to plan and that fundamentally everybody who wants to play the sport in whatever format this summer can do that and hopefully the 2021 summer will be remembered for all the right reasons yeah fingers crossed fingers crossed so John, what we did before this call is we we asked uh, we asked our, uh, our our fans and across social media and on the website to send in a few questions. And I've got a selection. Um, and the first one comes from Lee James on Facebook. And they asked, are there going to be a further improvements in the support the Bowls England offer clubs to help promote our game in positive modern ways? Well, absolutely. So club services are our number one priority. Uh, 2,000 clubs up and down the country pay their affiliation fees and our job is to ensure that we provide some great service and enable our clubs, which are the lifeblood of our sport, to be healthy and thriving and attracting new people. And so part of that consultation period uh, that I talked about earlier was asking all the clubs what was important to them. And over, over a thousand clubs responded to that and recruitment was the, the, the number one priority. And consequently, with our knowledge about the success of Open Days, Bowls Big Weekend was born and, and, and over 600 clubs have bought into that. And hopefully we'll see lots of people coming into the, the clubs up and down the country uh, and, and, and joining and growing the game. So on a similar note, um, there, were, there were plenty of other areas where you know, we can look at adding additional support, support over and above what's already as part of our affiliation. And that could be about business services. It could be helping people with pay and play options, um, helping them retain their, their membership uh, and, and really making sure that our clubs are healthy and thriving and growing, which is what we all want. Yeah, and I suppose on a similar vein, um, John Godman um, asked, do you see the need to overhaul the financial model of how clubs are financed? I think overhaul would probably be quite a, a, a strong word, but I do think that the business model of our clubs need to evolve. Um, and that evolution needs to be sympathetic with a change in the way that clubs think about membership. The trend in society now is for people to play their sport 
in more bite-sized chunks that fit around uh, the nature of modern day lifestyles. And when we looked at the uh, research from the clubs, uh, clubs tend to have a fairly binary membership model and we need to give um, more varying opportunities for people to join clubs and play the sport, which then starts to look at sort of different types of membership models within clubs uh, and different ways that the clubs can, can generate income. And if we get more people in our clubs playing in, 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 in different types of ways, that will not only drive more revenue from a, a membership perspective or from pay and play uh, options, but it will drive secondary spend. It also makes sponsorship propositions at, at clubs more attractive. Uh, and ultimately, it will it'll grow the, the financial sort of robustness, if you like, of our clubs. Because what we're seeing at the moment is that membership is either plateauing or slightly in decline, but cost, for example, greens maintenance is going up. And ultimately, all that means is it's going to be a cost more for people to, to play the sport. And we really need to, to change that. And I think there's some great things that we can do at, at a central level. You know, the insurance scheme with Sutton Winston that we work run is effectively like a collective buying, um, uh, uh, representing all our, all our 2000 clubs. And we need to do more of that so that we're offering um, uh, products and services that clubs want. Uh, cheaper through to, through the collective buying capability that we have uh, uh, at national level. Great. Um, slightly moving into a different area, um, Kate Sawyer on Facebook, uh, she asked, are there plans to make the structure of county associations more accessible to younger people, i.e. changing the times of meetings to evenings and weekends? Um, it's an interesting question, Kate. Um, Ultimately, our counties are their own entities, their own businesses, so it's not up for uh, Bowles England to dictate what they do. Um, but I think it's really, really important that across the, the whole sport, we're as accessible as possible. And I think if we want to uh, engage and excite more people to volunteer at every level, club uh, and county level, and also potentially volunteering at, at our major events, it's really, really important that those volunteering opportunities are accessible. So if counties are struggling to, to, to get volunteers, get people that are, are gonna do some uh, work on the committee, I know there's a real big gap around counties and social media and digital media. You know, may, maybe, maybe some of the counties who do put on their meetings at times that are not conducive to people who are working, maybe need to think about uh, changing some of that in order to inspire more people to volunteer. Yeah, and I think that, that leads quite nicely onto the sort of next topic I wanted to cover, which is about attracting new people to the sport um, and, and making it as accessible as possible for, for as many people as possible. Um, and um, this was uh, manifested in a question by Ross Turnbull, and he asked, how do we make bowls attractive on TV to potential bowlers? Well, that is a good question. Million dollar question. And, and uh, Ross's name is familiar. and I really feel like I, I want to thank Ross for all the hard work he's done. Uh, on Bowls Big Weekend has been part of the, the group that has been leading that project and he's been uh, of, of, of great value to us with his insight from uh, what's going on uh, in the West Country. So uh, thanks Ross. So in terms of the question specifically, well it's a tricky one and, and at the heart of it is what, what do broadcasters want uh, from, from sport and I think the answer to that is broadcasters are increasingly wanting short sharp formats of the game where where every moment uh, really matters. Um, they want their audience and, and sports fans or people tuning in to really understand and follow the competition from start to finish. They want teams and individuals that people can really care about and really be passionate about. And uh, then ultimately they want to showcase um, something that has got atmosphere and vibrancy and that comes across really, really well, uh, uh, you know, through through TVs into homes up and down the country. Um, and I think that we you know we've got a really interesting challenge as a sport about how we deliver that. I'm quite interested around the uh, Bowls uh, Premier League that Australia run, which is uh, televised by Fox Sport, you know, a mainstream broadcaster. And I think it's really interesting to look at the learnings from Australia who probably are in, in a number of areas a bit a bit further ahead of, of us in this country. And I think also we need to use the platform of Birmingham 2022 and the insight that we get from 
you know, a delivery of, of a tournament of that stature at Victoria Park to really think about how we evolve the game uh, to, to, to grow the spectator base and build on the 60 odd thousand people that will be watching the games uh, in Victoria Park next year. So it's a, it's a big focus. Uh, everybody wants the sport to be more visible. And I think we need to really rise to that challenge. And, and who knows, the sort of 2020 of bowls might be around the corner. Yeah, and that's a really good point, isn't it? I think that the key the key message is that there is, and cricket's a great example, um, that there are, there, there are formats that we can do to suit everybody's needs, right? It's not just one size fits all. Um, we've got to look at the different ways we can cater to different audiences. Absolutely, and I, I was at Edgbaston um, working for Warwickshire Category Club in 2003 when the ECB wandered into uh, uh, the boardroom at, at Edgbaston and told us about 2020 cricket. And um, you can imagine how that went down amongst uh, most uh, most people. Even the players thought it was a joke. I mean, they, they, I remember the first practice uh, session after this 2020 concept was announced and uh, basically everyone was just trying to slog it out of, the, out of the ground. It wasn't taken seriously. And the members were up in arms about it. It was going to be absolutely terrible. Um, a couple of months later, the first game, the stands were full, the members were quite intrigued to see what the, this was all about. And of course, it attracted a, a, a huge new audience of, of people, largely blokes who like cricket, for the first time thought, I can bring my friends who don't like cricket or my other yeah. half who isn't so keen on cricket to a match because they won't have to sit there all day uh, watching it. So um, you know, 20 years later, 2020 is a phenomenon and it's changed the shape of the game and it's uh, changed the way that test match cricket's played for, for the better in my opinion so I, I think that you know it's it's interesting when new things come come about in sports and how you balance that desire to retain some heritage to um, satisfy existing fans with that big opportunity of attracting new people yeah i think you're absolutely absolutely spot on um Scott Morland, it's a similar vein. He asked, is there scope to look to streaming the national finals in the near future? Definitely, actually. We've had conversations about that this week. Um, we'd love to do that. Of course, like everything, it's how do you how do you finance finance it? Um, but definitely uh, we, we need much more content uh, from our sport and obviously match match content and, and high quality high quality matches is 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 the core of of the content that comes out in in any sport, and given that we are sort of starved of of, of, of outdoor bowls on on TV, um, and given the platforms that are available and now to, to do streaming, it's definitely something that we want to to explore. So, uh, hopefully, Scott, um, that will happen sooner rather than later. Watch this space, Scott. Absolutely. <laughs> um, Greg Woodall asked. Um, and this is moving, I suppose, into a slightly different area, but it sort of fits in with with uh, street, I suppose, the sort of performance aspect of, of the sport. So looking at the funding of the elite game versus the recruitment of, of new grassroots bowlers, what is the split of uh, Bowls England time and funds now? And what is the ideal split in the future? Wow, that's a that's a very specific question. Um, I don't know if Greg wants you to go into exact figures. Well, um, so I can tell us if he does. So, so, from a budgetary perspective, uh, international bowls takes up about fifteen percent of our budget. Uh, in terms of time, less so because we rely heavily on on volunteers. Um, uh, so, so probably a bit less of our of our time. And it's interesting because there's a perception that Bowls England is fairly elitist, but obviously that the lion's share of our work is around around grassroots bowls. I think the, the key thing for me is the importance to, to educate everyone uh, of the value of world class performance. You know, the international team can bring amazing moments of joy and pride to a sport. Uh, massive impact on the visibility of a sport, um, inspire new participants, particularly amongst youngsters. And I was lucky enough to, to be at England and Great Britain hockey for 10 years. And I saw at first hand that connection between the success of the national team and our, 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 our women's team, one in, in Rio, which was wonderful, um, didn't quite win sports team of the year award. I think Leicester City beat us to it, uh, to, to it that year. 
but the the impact of that and the 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 visibility of women's hockey and then a 90 percent growth of young girls playing the sport off the back of that you know is, is is really really important so we do need to continue to invest in that international game we need to connect the international game better to the rest of the sport and it's been fantastic over the last sort of couple of weeks to see um uh, the Coach Bowles guys working with the international players uh, during their preparation, uh, early stage of their preparation for, for Birmingham. But also it's been fantastic to see the number of uh, international bowlers that are taking part in Bowles Big, Week, Big, 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 Bowles Big Weekend and are going down to the clubs and um, inspiring people that are, are new to the game to, to, to enjoy it and to hopefully stick with it. So um, I hope that answers Greg's question, sort of spe spe specifically, um, and it's and it's an area that that I really hope that that can can develop really positively, and and that the top players can continue being role models for for everyone in our sport.